Eduardo Luft from the University of Porto Alegre in Brazil, uh, where he has a, a chair for theoretical philosophy. His interests uh, are wide-ranged from uh, classical German philosophy to contemporary uh, American analytic philosophy. And uh, as he will no, with no doubt present you tonight, he is an outstanding uh, systematic um, uh, philosopher who will uh, present you the, the core of his current systematic research project, Deflationary Ontology. Uh, I will read my paper in English, and then after you can make a dialogue about the, the points. Uh, modernity is a uh, permeated from its inception by a self-interpretation crisis. What is the place of subjectivity in a world ruled by deterministic laws? The self-image of the thinking subject as a free being, besides bearing an instituting meaning, cannot be preserved if it is be considered part of the nature machine. However, if the subject is not part of nature, what is its ontological locus? To overcome the paradoxical situation in which the modern subject finds itself on conceptualizing nature in such a way that its very presence in nature becomes inconceivable. Modernity supplies at least four alternatives. The first is to defend dualism, that is, to preserve the self-image of the subject and its new conceptualization of nature, but to split these two poles into independent spheres, Descartes and Kant. The second option is to support a monism of nature, that is, to preserve the mechanist view and reinterpret the self-image of the subject in such a way as to integrate it to the nature machine as a whole. Spinoza and Hobbes, for example. The third alternative is to defend a monism of subjectivity. To deal with this impasse, we seek to reconstruct our concept of nature with a view to integrating it in our self-image, in the case of Fichte, for example. The fourth and last alternative is, in a way, the most radical one, since it launches itself against the core of modern thinking, requiring the reconceptualization of both the poles of opposition, that is, to support a dialectical monism, in the case of Schelling and Hegel. It is, it is well known that of these four alternatives to the self-interpretation crisis of modern subjectivity, the first ultimately had a more lasting influence on the philosophical scene, reinforced by the recent collapse of Marxism, marking point to point the la this last breath of modernity that some call postmodern and flowing into the present situation of hyper-incommensurability between subject and nature, diagnosed by Bruno Latour. How can this be explain it. The answer given by Latour in We Have Never Been Modern appears the most plausible to me. <coughs> Dualism is not one option among others proper, but the touchstone of a culture that has operated since the beginning under the assumption of a non-explicit agreement or of a constitution that institutes the cesura between nature and subjectivity. Following the implicit rules of the modern constitution, in the concept of Latour, each of the spheres in conflict acquires rights and restrictions. The knowledge that represent human beings have the rights to their own object of study and inquiry, the sphere of meaning, values, of offness, and on the other hand, an original restriction. These knowledge have nothing to say about nature or about the impact of sciences on nature. 
On the other hand, the sciences proper are restricted by not being able to interfere in human issues, but have the potentially infinite field of nature entirely at their disposal, without any ethical restriction emanating from the subjectivity pole. It happens that the establishment of this constitution, this founding act of modernity, is at the same time a requirement and an impossibility. That knowledge that institutes the demarcating line that is philosophy itself does not reside within any of the fields that are in dispute here, does not reside in one of the poles proper, but transcends them, and precisely for this reason cannot be conceptualized, since all of the modern conceptualization presupposes a a prior establishment of that founding cut. The founding philosophical perspective of modernity is like the Kantian broken trace of the demarcating line between the, the thing in itself and the phenomenon. It is at the same time the most originary postulate of modern thinking and the mark of its unfeasibility. Here is the exotic or even histrionic rule of philosophy in modernity. It builds the board of the game of a game from which, as a principle, it is excluded. Following the logic of this dubious game, philosophy loses not only epistemic authority when what is at stake is objective knowledge, it is also displaced to the edges of knowledge that represent men human being, close to the human sciences, only tolerated here in the subjectivity pole as a rather exotic knowledge, and remembered there in the science pole proper as the distant birthplace of the natural sciences, the old mother who died millennia ago, of whom one has a tenuous memory and who deserves that at least a few wilted flowers be deposited on her tongue. In fact, philosophy, thus displaced, thrown to the college of philosophy and human sciences, completely loses its usefulness or even its viability. The crisis of subjectivity thus becomes a crisis of philosophy which does not miss the chance of reaffirming loudly and clearly to whomever still wishes to hear every new day its own new death in the voices of Heidegger, Wittgenstein or Sura. Indeed, from the beginning, this was its natural path to establish the modern constitution, concealing itself, to ground while already sinking found while foundering. Deprived of an own object of investigation or of any sensible task, philosophy must reinvent itself as a knowledge from nothing to nothing. Even the impossibility of such a strange task, despite all the many conceptual turns taken by the philosophers in search of the legitimation of such an exotic knowledge, a knowledge that was different, in principle, from all knowledge, precisely because it does not have any object of its own, philosophy ultimately becomes a hostage to the syndrome of the house taking over, to use the beautiful image of a short story by Cortázar, a Argentinian writer, established in the old subjectivity pole, insisting on the game of a dualism, which is already undergoing complete collapse, and seeing the continuous advance of empirical sciences on all environments of the old construct, philosophy fights desperately to preserve something that can be its own, an exclusively an exclusive research topic, but at every new object it takes for itself another is torn from it. 
The old modern will say particle physics can do a lot, but is incapable of dramatizing life, and the multiple philosophies of life appear in Bergson, Scheller, etc. Until life is definitely torn from the new philosophy by the dissemination of Darwinism. Then the various lines of non-empirical psychological idealism gain strength, neo-Kantianism, phenomenology, philosophy of the mind, etc. Until the mind is torn from philosophy by the cognitive, cognitive sciences. Who knows though? No. And who knows then? Maybe language, this undefined core of new idealism, could be the soft four object, but the empirical sciences of language appear. Finally, the less space remains, the entire broad territory of the normative disciplines. It happens that the sphere of pure, of pure offness is a perfectly empty sphere, a hollow replica of the normativity that de facto emanates from the concrete forms of sociability or from the concrete modes of realizing knowledge. Obviously, it will not take, it, it will not be long before this space in its non-fictitious aspects, is again stolen from philosophy by empirical research, given rise to sociobiology, to the naturalized epistemology, to the naturalized ethics, and so on. Based on this diagnosis, what could philosophy still do? Well, this is a misleading question, since it begins with the situation that has already been consummated in the distorted distorted self-image that generated the crisis of philosophy. I would like to change the focus on, of our attention, renewing the question about the viability today of dialectical monism. Does the fourth way to deal with the crisis of modernity have anything to tell us nowadays? Whatever the project of reconstruction of dialectical thinking, one must always bear in mind that the objections raised by outstanding thinkers against central insights of Hegel's philosophy. A key role in this context is played by the critic developed by late Schelling in his lectures Zur Geschichte der Neuen Philosophie. I'm thinking above all about the denunciation of a deficiency in Hegel's treatment of the concept of contingency in the science of logic and the, cons the, the consequent distorted understanding of the role of, of the individual in the system of philosophy. In a semester duvida, I propose reinforcing these two objections, deficiency in the treatment of contingency and freedom, articulating them with a third critique inspired by Feuerbach, that is the accusation of dogmatism, and referring them all to what I consider their common root, the awareness of the inconsistencies originating in Hegel's attempt to conceptualize dialectical processuality in the light of what I nowadays call teleology of the condition, a constitutive mark of the Hegelian concept. The response to the aforementioned objections to Hegel's dialectic requires breaking with the teleology of the condition. Since the logicity of the concept structures the system of philosophy as a whole, its problematization requires the global restructuring of the dialectical system. In my view, the most important structural changes are the following. A. The refusal of the project of providing the ultimate foundation for knowledge with the corresponding collapse of the dualism between phenomenon, phenomenal knowledge and absolute knowledge, between phenomenology of spirit and science of logic, and advocacy of a fallibilistic epistemology. B. The collapse of the dualism between logic and philosophy of the real, the basic premise of Hegel's objective idealism, and affirmation of an evolutionary idealism. And C. The transformation of the inflationary metaphysics of concepts into a deflationary ontology anchored in the principle of coherence. It is not my intention here to present in detail all these topics involved in the reformulation of, a dialect, of dialectical philosophy. My purpose is to spell out, within the limits of this text, the general lines of the deflationary ontology that results from the refusal of the teleology of the unconditioned. 
Deflationary ontology can be achieved by two paths which at first glance are independent, but ultimately turn out to be complementary paths of the same movement of deflation of classical ontology. The ascending path, ascending dialectic or analysis, seeks to fulfill the potential of self-transcendence of the particular sciences and bifurcates into two trajectories. On the one hand, it leads from Plato's theory of ideas to classical biology and thence to his Darwinian critique. On the other, we take the direct path that goes from Platonism to Bertha Lenfis system theory, systems theory. Both these directions are finally unified in the theory of complex adaptive systems. The descending path, descending dialectic or catabasis, seeks to fulfill the potential of immanence of philosophy and bifurcates also into two routes. On the one hand, it traces the influence exerted by the theory of ideas in German idealism, and then spells out the deflationary consequences of the critic of Hegel's dialectic. On the other, it goes directly from the critic of the theory of ideas vehiculated in the dialogue Parmenides of Plato, the deflationary ontological approach found in Philebus. In the following, I will focus on the descending path aiming to make explicit the rule laid by the critic of the Hegelian philosophy in the renewal of dialectical ontology. A serious opposition to Hegelian philosophy needs to start with an investigation of the concept of the Hegelian concept and its logical structure developed in the science of logic. Obviously, here I do not intend to perform an exhaustive reconstruction of Hegel's logic, but rather to present it in its more general traits, such that light can be shed on the global project exposed in it. There are, uh, there are three phases or moments of activity of self-expression of thought, passing, shining and development. The first steps of logic expose and dissolve the, the, the Delotational and atomist substantially semantics that resides in the core of the classical metaphysics, transmuting it into an expressivist and relational semantics. The meaning of the categories is given not by the fact that they denote something in the world or the world itself as a supposed metaphysical object, but because they are co expressed together with other categories in given semantic configurations. In the second movement, Hegel will expose and solve relational semantics itself as pervaded by the deficit of bad infinity. If any determination, in this case determination of meaning, assumes a relationship, then a given category, let's say A, will not, could not be determined under the assumption that some other thought determination, let's say B, were also determined, and the determination of B would depend on the determination of C, and so on. Hegel's solution to this impasse was clearly forcing by Plato. All relational theory of determination thought, of thought determination, are being suppose holism. Any category is only determined semantically by itself as a moment of a self referent categorical network or a given self-coherent semantic configuration. Any relational semantics and ontology presuppose holism. Thus we clearly see the minimalist principle that pervades all dialectical theory from Plato to Hegel, the principle of coherence, that says only what is coherent remains determined. However, expressing the semantic configurations in networks of thought determinations conceived as purely formal or quantifiable structures, the dialectical process is undone again in contradictions. All purely formal thought presuppose external rules that cannot be thematized or constituted inside the formal structure itself. Given this original deficit, the, the measure, the standard presupposed by the activity of quantification, is considered itself a pure possibility. Possible changes in the rules of quantification undo me measure in the measureless. The logic of shining doctrine of essence, the Hegel's logic, 
radicalized the previous movement, the measured glass is potentialized in shining, which undoes all the configurations of thought in pure possibilities. There are no essence of thought, no immutable structures, to which one can appeal in the task of self-expression of thought. In the logic of development, all previous thought determinations are repressed and again determined as manifestations of the process of self-determination of thought. Thought determinations are now expressed in networks of thought configured as concepts. Concepts, in turn, are expressed in conceptual networks or judgments, today we will say propositions. And judgments are expressed in syllogisms, today we would say inferences. We have reached the apex of Hegel's logic. The types of syllogism com complexify the minimal structure of the demand of for coherence to which I have referred. The different ways in which universality, par particularity, and singularity are articulated in the syllogisms should make explicit the modes of manifestation of the concept that would complete the logical space as moments in the self-determination process of the concept towards its full expression and complete determination. The self-determination process, at the end of Hegel's logic, takes on the characteristic traits of what I call teleology of unconditioning. Not only the end of the logic, but all previous acts of thought that, led, that lead to the desired end, from the first act that intended to express being as a thought determination, and continued into the becoming, are now conceived as necessary moments, necessary prefigurations of Hegel's concept. Elsewhere, I developed the following immanent critique of the Hegelian project for the consummation of the dialectical process in the ultimate foundation of the system of philosophy. If the full expression of thought by thought itself is not consummated, logic cannot achieve its ultimate foundation. And in this sense, it is not different from the phenomenology itself in its deficit of foundation. However, if this expression is consummated, no new contradiction is possible, nor is the process to overcome the contradictions even possible. Hegel's dialectic, thus consummated, is under. Now we have enhanced the philosophical background to make explicit the project of deflationary ontology. Previously, we found out that the teleology of the condition is anchored in the logic syllogistic structures of the doctrine of the concept. To deny it means to completely rethink the logic ontological hypothesis transmitted in the outcome of the Hegelian logic, that is, now we must re express the concept itself without the necessary presence of those structures. Hence, we extend the same radical doubt that solved supposedly rigid structures in the doctrines of being and of essence, to the doctrine of the concept. All the logical structures manifested in the doctrine of the concept are transmuted, except for the principle of coherence itself, into possible but not necessary configurations. In other words, contingent configurations. In turn, contingency is no longer conceived as a factor outside of the logical and begins to constitute the way of being of dialectical rationality. Although the dialectical process, and as in Hegel, flows into a relational and holistic ontology, there are multiple, potentially infinite ways of realizing the coherence of the whole. Since the telos the immanent telos of the dialectical process is only an alone self-coherence. The complex web of the categorical system developed in Hegel's logic because it becomes a minimalist structure. The dialectical logicity becomes the expression only and alone of the principle of coherence. This process of radical reduction of complexity of the theory of first principles is a deflation. An ontology constituted based on this reduction process is a deflationary ontology. Coherence is the unity of a multiplicity or a multiplicity in unity. Coherence can occur at the extremes of the maximum predominance of the one over the many or vice versa. 
We make a dialogue here with the theory of first principles developed by the late Plato in his dialogue Philebus. The notes of identity, invariance, and determination should be associated with the one, and the notes of difference, variation, and underdetermination with the many. I call the movement towards the maximum predominance of the one over the many uniformization. The opposite movement is diversification. It is self-determination in, in its self-determination process. In cosmology, the universe moves eternally, exploring all the potential infinite ways of realizing the dialectic of the one. Let us now perform the following experiment of thought. Let us imagine ourselves following the movement that goes from maximum diversification to maximum uniformization. Observing the presence, the presence of increasingly less difference and more identity, less variation and more invariance, less other determination and more determination in the universal becoming. The maximum degree of predominance of the one over the many would occur in the more simple configuration of universe possible in a dynamic relational ontology. Self-determination reduces to the mere repetition of the identity of the universe with itself. I call the configuration of universe which expresses this state of maximum uniformization the whole world of Parmenides, the realm of pure being. No residue of the many appears to remain the world of Parmenides. It appears to be completely annihilated in pure identity, but that is not what in fact happens. Identity with oneself supposes the difference between two terms in a relationship. Besides this minimum difference, the repetition of the identity of the world still expresses the universal becoming and not an impervious identity. The being of Parmenides is not in fact pure being. The appearing inhabits it, even if downgraded to its minimalist version. The totality of the world is still an event and thus variation. Most decisively, the extreme manifestation of the predominance of the old one of the many is only one among the potential infinite manifestations of the coherence of the whole with itself. The universe always exceeds this or that configuration of the world, considering the principle of self-transcendence, and will not take long to develop new configurations showing that what appeared to be the realm of the purest and most absolute perfection, the realm of pure being, actually contains the dense presence of the peering, which will soon reveal its strength. Any subsequent manifestation of diversity, for instance, the onset of new events, new relationships, or new modes of self-organization process, beyond the redundancy of self-identity, will lead to the collapse of that minimalist systemic configuration. Thus we perceive, not without a certain measure of surprise, that the static and supposedly pure realm of being is actually a highly unstable and probable manifestation of self-coherence. We can, can now move in the opposite direction, taking the path that leads from the maximum uniformization to the maximum diversification. The universal becoming now goes towards the maximum realization of the predominance of the many of the one. This process is associated initially with a determined complexification of the universe. New events and new relationships are explicated, determinedly unfolded from a given principle of order, whatsoever. However, the mere explication of a totality of events based on the principle of order does not yet mirror the maximum predominance of the diversification. Only the underdetermined variation expresses the true potency of the many. As the universe approaches greater diversification, the less stringent mode of self-determination process is detectable, increasing similar to a vast disorder. Multiplicity, initially determined, more and more reveals its genuine phase, that is, as a multiplicity underdetermined by the configuration of the universe. The new determinations engendered by the global system the specific world that is the issue here are prefigured only as mere definite possibilities by their self-determination process. 
This I call first degree of potentiality. Finally, the very configurations of the world in which the universe is manifested prove less and less determined. The extreme phase of diversification implies the transformation of actual events into pure indefinite possibilities, enveloped or surrounded by a minimalist actual system configuration. This I call second degree of potentiality. The maximum underdetermination occurs in a simple system in which only the self relationship of the whole remains determined the world of gorgeous, the pure appearing. Here I strictly distinguish between underdetermination and indetermination. Underdetermination is a property of an event whose occurrence is only one among n definite or indefinite possibilities in a limited field of possibilities of occurrence, considering the validity of a given principle of order. In the case of indetermination, on the contrary, we presuppose an unlimited, unrestricted field of possibilities. Now, an unrestricted few is no field at all. In Menasu's words, and against him, there is no virtuality, only potentiality in the universe. The merger between ascending and descending dialectics, the convergence between the movement of generalization of the theory of complex adaptive systems, together with the generalization of network theory, and the path that leads from the critical to Hegel's philosophy to a deflationary ontology provides a powerful way to build a formal theory of the evolutionary logical space. I, I, I appeal appealing here to the, the network theory, but my, my thinking, uh, we could uh, reduce system theory to a theory of to network theory and reduce network theory to graph theory, but I, I would not uh, develop this point uh, in, this, in this difficult plot point in this lecture. Then I presuppose here a dialogue with network theory. What, are, what we call the world of Parmenides can be approximately formalized as a kind of Hegelian network, while the world of Gorgias could be formalized as a kind of random network. But appearing in the pure relationship with itself is only the counterpart of being in the same situation. And the two opposites do not differ anymore, at least not in the sense of found the antagonistic configuration of a world. Being and appearing show themselves as what they are, aspects of one and the same configuration of universe, which expresses the extreme limits at which the at which the antagonistic roots of universal becoming coincide. We are surprised to understand that the antagonistic path of maximum universalization and the, the same uh, and the maximum diversification converge towards one and the same center and repose provisionally therein, coinciding in one and the same configuration of universe, in one and the same world. That what would be would appear as a as a line going to these opposite extremes uh, uh, manifestation of coherence converge to a one and the same world. The antagonistic movements merge only being distinguished from the perspective of those who aim at initiating them, taking into account the genesis of that configuration. I call this world in which the world of Parmenides and the world of Gorgias, the realms of pure being and pure appearing, coincide the world of Cousinus. Nicolas Cousinus. In this brief thinking experiment, we saw unfold before us the structure itself of the evolutionary logical space. The world of Parmenides and the world of Gorgias are possible worlds given the objecti objective validity of the principle of coherence and therefore of the dialectic of the one and the many. In the process of self organization of the universe, situated among these extreme phases in which possibly the universal becoming manifests itself, other potentially infinite possible worlds unfold, forming the totality of evolution evolutionary logical space. In order to understand this figure, each point in the correspond to a possible world in cosmology, but we can think the logical space as a space of thinking, for example. This is for another lecture. In order to then we have worlds here. 
Each point is a possible world. The traced lines inside the circumference only serve to demarcate the quadrants, which are numbered from 1 to 4. For this very reason, the figure is clearly a simplification. Since there are potentially infinite possible worlds, and the number of points which form the circumference re represented here is finite, the black arrow pointing downwards on the right of the circumference indicates that the world situated in the lower semicircumference, closer therefore to the world of Leibniz, are more coherent to see, with the dynamism of the universal becoming and can generate their own history, as we, you see. The world of Leibniz is thus the attractor of the universal becoming. The world of Parmenides is actually the world of Cusanus itself, observed from the perspective of someone who follows the circular movement which goes from the right to the left, the universal move, uniformization movement. Following the trajectory of the blue arrows within the circle, thus beginning near of the world of Gorgias, passing by the world of Leibniz and leading to the world of Parmenides. The blue, uh, the blue arrow with a continuous traced lines to an actual world uh, line points to the actual world in which the universal becoming manifests itself still on the way of, to maximum uniformization. The world of Gorgias is the world of Cusanus itself seen from the perspective of someone who follows the opposite movement, following the circular movement which goes from the left to the right, from the world of Parmenides passing to the world of, by li of Leibniz and leading into the world of Gorgias. At the stream of the logical space, of the, at, at the other extreme of the logical space, in the opposite direction of the whole world of Cusanus, is the world of Leibniz, which can be formalized in terms of network theory as a kind of skid free network, a concept co coined by Barabasi, mathematical, mathematics and, and physics. The, 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 the key role that the world of Leibniz plays in the inflationary ontology and in the evolutionary cosmology, which derives from it, can only be adequately understood by spelling out the radical symmetry between the upper semicircumference and the lower semicircumference of the evolutionary logical space. Now, those configurations of universe or those worlds which manifest themselves as extreme forms of predominance of the one over the many, which are situated in quadrant two, are too ordered to be able to adapt to the extreme dynamic environment generated by the deflationary ontology. On the opposite side, situated in quadrant one, we have worlds which, on the contrary, are too unstable to remain self-coherent as specific configurations of universe and thus to, ge thus to, to generate a history of their own. The attractor of universal becoming is therefore the place where we find configurations of the universe which are able to realize a reasonably balanced proportion of the one and the many. Flexible systems are those that can combine in themselves moments of identity and difference, of invariance and variation, of determination and underdetermination without collapsing the systems. Their flexibility allows their adaptation or coherence at least to a certain extent, the universal becoming. If this is so, this configuration of world can be generate, can then generate a specific direction of universal becoming, a history, an evolution of their own. They can generate subsystems, complexify and resist the impact of what is contingent in the new in the universe, without becoming under. As we know, Leibniz considered that among the n possible worlds at God's disposal. Disposal, taking into account the validity of the principles of non contradiction and sufficient reason, God had chosen the best one, that is, the world that contains the greatest order under the greatest possible variety, citation of monotology. That is why the world in which the balanced proportion of the one and the many is manifested, the attractor of the universal becoming, is called the world of Leibniz. I do not presuppose here, on the other hand, a metaphysics of transcendence, much less the thesis that this is, is the, the world that manifests itself necessarily having in view the validity of the principle of coherence. The attractor of the natural becoming is not its necessary end, but a point of reference 
close to each world that are more coherent with the processuality of the whole tend to manifest themselves. I, then, I thus advocate here an evolutionary cosmology. The universe moves eternally in the field of all possible configurations of the universe, worlds. In the general becoming of the universe, the configuration of the universe coherent with the highly dynamic environment promoted by the process of self-determination of the universe as a system lasts longer. The preservation of the coherent forms in the historical becoming and the overcoming of incoherent forms is natural selection. The historical becoming of the universe in its tendency towards greater coherence, always context dependent, is the evolution. Let me conclude by emphasizing that current research has made it clear that the tendency towards the world of Leibniz is a universal property of evolution. That is, we find this, this uh, asymmetry of the evolutionary logical space not only in cosmology, we find this, for example, in philosophy of language, if we apply this evolutionary logical space to a field of thinking, of language. We find this in the spheres, uh, diverse uh, ontological spheres. In the specific case of the regional ontology, which we find in the biological sphere, Autocatalytic molecular networks, equal to living beings, compete with each other in the search for the fittest, the most, most coherent with itself and the surroundings, gestating a scenario which the theoreticians of evolution call fitness landscape. It is no coincidence that the fitness landscapes that really exist are similar to rough correlated landscapes and not with a random fitness landscape situated in the vicinity of the world of gorgeous, or an ordered fitness landscape situated in the vicinity of the world of Parmenides. This happens for the same reason that there is an asymmetry between the lower and the upper semicircle circles in the logical spa space of the possible worlds. We find a predominance of systems close to the world of Leibniz, that is, systems that configure, them, configure themselves as skill-free networks not only in real fitness landscapes, but also in very different ontological spheres. As Barabasi notes, a citation here, the discovery that on the web a few hubs grab most of the links initiated a frantic search for hubs in many areas. The results are startling. We now know that Hollywood, the web and society are not unique by any means. Hubs and therefore scale free networks appear in most large complex networks that scientists have been able to study so far. They are ubiquitous, ubiquitous, a generic building block of our complex interconnected world. End of station and of end of the lecture. I thank you. Okay. Uh, well, I'm not so long. We, we still have okay. a time for some for some questions. So you can ask either in uh, English or German. Okay. So there was a lot contained in that presentation. So I try to find a a landscape. To, Makes sense. That's either fit 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 or not fit. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I noticed um, Badu was absent um, yeah. from this, which I found interesting because the one of the many uh, for Badu is such an important um, distinction. And he introduces this distinction between inconsistent multiplicity and consistent multiplicity. Yeah. But for Badu, in order to have consistent multiplicity, we require a count. And which the count, a consistent multiplicity can only occur when we have a subject that makes the inconsistent multiplicity consistent. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think Badu remains Kantian um, in a sense that he doesn't have, despite what he thinks, a subtractive uh, ontology um, that can have a, a consistent multiplicity without a subject. But then in actor network theory and Bruno Latour, you have this kind of deflated Kantianism or a deflated Wittgenstein where you ontologize Kant um, and say that the subject-object relation 
is just a difference in degree from object-object relations in general. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing special about the subject-object relation in the world. Mm -hmm. It's just simple. It's not a difference in kind, it's a difference in degree. Mm -hmm. um, but then, in, in the uh, Latour, um, has a kind of death of God occasionalism, where mm -hmm. Mellenbrank has also this kind of monadological ontology, but then he has to have God, it also Whitehead has this, where God has to um, make consistent this otherwise chaotic mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And then Latour says, no, no, a death of God uh, um, occasionalism would be that in order to have a network mm -hmm. in this monadological ontology, um, we have to have a third synthetic object which connects one object. But then you have this infinite regress, and then Latour has this pragmatic solution where he says, well, at some point you just have to give up. Um, we can never find the ultimate foundation of, um, of, of what, apply, what, what uh, generates a consistent multiplicity in the world. So my question is, on this model, um, we started out talking about the subject and where we can find a place to fit the subject into kind of modern mechanical world, we have this distinction there. But um, what is deflated in deflationary ontology? Is it the, the notion of the subject um, creating kind of uh, connection in a, in a mona, monadological ontology? Um, I don't know if any of this makes sense or not. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, good, uh, good, and, good and big question. That's <laughs> a very good uh, uh, I, I to confess, I, I, my contact with uh, contemporary French philosophy is more with Latour, but with Badiou, for example, is very recent. My inspiration to, to, to build this internal critic of Hegel is directly taken from Hegel, a dialogue with Hegel. It's my background, yeah. my, my, my real background. Yeah. And the other background is the direct Plato's. And the, the concept of one man here is the, the dialogue direct, uh, made directly with the Philebus dialogue. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I don't take, I don't uh, uh, write about this in this essay because it is too long. And, but it's implicit a direct dialogue with Plato. Because I think the, the problem with our present ontologies, that it, uh, this kind of, this, our ontologies remain dualist. In the case of Badiou, it's very, very clear. We have a position between the one and the many. Uh, is, a, is, a, is a really dualist uh, uh, structure. We find similar structure, in, for example, in, uh, in uh, uh, Levinas. is a position between ontology and fair ethics. The ethics of the order and ontology as a self-referent entity, and uh, and uh, my my point here to to, to 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 build this kind of deflationary ontology is to to go directly to to our origin in Plato philosophy, and uh, and uh, make explicit that Plato has a profound, a deeply critic against his own theory as a dualist. Uh, he, uh, he made strong critique in Parmenides against the dualism between ideas and, and between forms, ideas and, and phenomena. And uh, I think that uh, he builds a new theory in Philippus. And this, the, 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 the original point here is that the many is not the other, the external world of thing, things or phenomena. But uh, the many is an uh, in, uh, is an inner structure of the theory of the first principles, and uh, and this explains uh, the, 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 the this uh, allows me to respond to the second point because with this direct uh, link with Plato, we don't have a theory a dualism between subject and object. We have a, a theory of the structure. Yes, that is common to the thinking subject and to the world. What is ideas for Plato, for Plato, or the one and the many for Plato, and what is logos for Heraclitus, and what is idea or concept for Hegel? Then we don't have a opposition between subject and object, and we don't build a, an ontology from this dualism. 
we have a theory of first principles. And the deflation ontology is constructed directly on this theory of the identity between being and the world. But then uh, comes another problem, because uh, what can we just justify this identity? This is a big question for another lecture, because this uh, goes to a critique against the mode that, uh, which Hegel, uh, that Hegel developed to respond to this epistemological and logical question. But I, I, don't, I, I don't know if I respond to the, to the points. The desperation is, is really platonic. And my dialogue with uh, Mela Su and uh, with Padu is very recent in my career. Mm. And uh, it's very important to me, but very recent. Mm. And I, my, my, my first impression is that we have a dualism in all ontological theories at our disposal today. I, I, I found this uh, and uh, continue to find this dualism in all ontologies, in really all ontologies at our disposal. That is the reason why I, I make this uh, theory of the taking over ho house, because it's very important to me. Make this reinterpretation of our modern situation, to rethink our ontologies in a new kind of framework. This is the... Then I go not to Kant or to go directly to, to Plato, to build a, a, po a possible uh, uh, hypo hypothetical ontology. So this was also Whitehead's point that uh, uh -huh. he said, I don't, I don't, I don't Oh, know. so history of philosophy is a yeah. footnote yeah. in well, the work this, of but also Plato. He said, I don't totally even, agree. I don't even care if you call me, I don't even care if you say that I'm doing pre-critical, um, pre-Kantian yeah. metaphysics. I don't even yeah, but the, the, we have a, a big problem here. I, uh, with, uh, Hegel make a strong point when uh, he... Uh, develop a, a, a dialogue with Fichte, uh, Fichte and Kant uh, against Schelling. Uh, we need a new ontology, not a pre-Kantian ontology. But I don't develop my point here about this metalogic and metapistemological points. This is very important to me. I, I have a, a hypothesis about the meta epistemology and metalogy to respond to this dialogue with uh, uh, transcendental philosophy is very important because without this dialogue, we we really we we go to a pregnant kind of ontology. I think there was one aspect in this question that huh? we didn't answer. What, huh? what happens to the subject in deflationary ontology? Yes. Okay. There is a. I was going to let slide. The, the first point. The first point that uh, we. we we don't have we don't have a theory about the subject in opposition to, for example, nature, or for example, objects, or for example, so and so on. We we need to have a theory about the 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 the, the, the common structure that integrates integrates subject in nature and nature in subject, but not as a kind of duty. That, uh, uh, Hegel uh, uh, made a strong point here when he declare, declares that uh, he says that uh, he said that uh, the, 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 the classical ontology is uh, right uh, talking about this identity between thinking and being. And I, I totally agree with this point, but this not means that we we can. Uh, 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 don't, we don't talk about transcendental philosophy and methodological and so on. We need to talk. But the theory of, of, of subject appears in two points here in the methodologic and metapistemology and in the, in the ontology. But viewed not uh, from their perspective of the dualist position between object and subject, viewed in another framework. Uh, so. But. Uh, Yes, we need to develop, develop this, 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 this kind of thing. But the point, the, the point of departure is, is not the modern theory of subject. And modern theory of language that opposes language and nature, or language and so on. It's not mind and nature. No, it's another, it's another, another point of view. More in Athenian and Platonic than the Kantian. Other questions? Uh, uh, I have a question.
question about the yeah, what does it mean in fact to the natural, as you said, natural attractor of the uh, of the natural uh, of the becoming of the world is from the from the Parmenidian world? Yeah. The like eating. I think why in fact. No, no, no. We have we can have all movements that we can think about. So we can we can have a movement from the from the world of Marcus to the world of Marcus. We can we can have the opposite <coughs> movement. This this question is not determined for the beginning. Uh -huh. the, the, the 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 relational ontology in dialectics only only affirms the uh, our, our principles. The, uh, the need for cohesiveness. But what we build, literally, as thinking subjects, or what the nature builds as nature, is not, is not uh, determined previously at all. What we have is a... Uh, is, uh, there is two, 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 movement, two logical movements here. The, the first logical movement, the first logical movement, all the worlds are uh, equitable, on the same level, and all worlds can appear, or of course, it's Parmenides and so on. In the second movement, goes an asymmetry. It's not historical, it's logical. Goes the asymmetry. Because these worlds that can combine this order and chaos, or identity and variance, determination and undetermination, has the structure proper to remain and generate and history, and has the flexibility to adapt to contingent uh, uh, appearance of what it gets. And uh, in the second movement, we have this asymmetry. This is because we find ourselves in the world uh, permeated by scale-free networks, because these networks are more adapted for these environments, varied dynamic environments, because permeated of contingent of contingency. This is the question. But we can, but we can have all kinds of movements. Okay. I see. Yeah. But the question, uh, second question is about the uh, talk about the order and the chaos. Yeah. So the 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 the, the, the Parmenidian universe of so the Parmenidian mm -hmm. world would be the 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 world of the traffic order. In the and first the movement. Yeah, that this is this very very important, uh, very 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 important uh, because uh, we tend to view, we, we tend to call, uh, we tend to understand coherence as linked to order because in the first logical movement we tend to view the logical the the evolutionary logical space as the, as contaminated by this asymmetry. Order is the world of Armenius, and this order in the world of Gorgias. Then we, we build, uh, 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 incline it, a, uh, uh, we kind of this construct that relates coherence with order. But in the second logical movement, we, we, pers we understand that the, the really coherence goes not in the order, in the pure order, but close to the world of Leibniz. This is a very important point, because when Hegel opposed the logic of understanding to a dialectical logic, he has this uh, inclined view that he has uh, this, uh, he relates, relates dialectical concepts with order against contingency. And what we have here is not this inclination, not this disposition. The the order that we, the, the order that we find in the real world is not the order or the of the world of Parmenides. This is a very important point for, for ontology and for ethics. For example, in the Habermas, uh, in the theory of Habermas of ethics, we tend to link. Uh, the better order in the ethical community with constants. But it's wrong. It's wrong. Yeah. The middle, in the middle, we find not constants, but a balance between 
consents and dissents. This is the really theory, ontological, not foundation, I, I, I don't, uh, not, not foundation, but okay, the really core of the ethics, mm -hmm. ethics, this balanced view between consents and dissents, not a theory of consents. And, and, uh, but uh, we, need to, uh, we, we need a new theory of rationality, because our modern theory is always made with this preconception. We identify coherence with order. Yes. And build theory of concepts in ethics. Theory of ontology as the predominance of the one in Levinas, or the set theory in the case of Badiou. It's always this inclined view of this uh, view of of order, but uh, the dialectical theory of rationality is an, uh, another view of, of of order. Order also can be like uh, considered like a subsuming like a multiplicity under the one. Yeah. Yeah. This is uh, the like the it reason for be like uh, we are we having the aim that going. Uh, I, 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 can, I, I can explain now, but the reason for the inflationary tendency of the classical metaphysics from the first Plato to Neoplatonism, to Hegel and so on, to Marx and so on, is this tendency to, to integrate the many in the one, to view order, to view, to view coherence and rationality as order. Yes. This is the, the real ground or foundation for the inflation of the tendency of classical ontology. We can, we, I, I, can, I can prove that in my, in my arguments. Uh, today I, I, I built the, this uh, reconstruction of dialectic following the path, the descending path, going from Hegel to system theory and network theory. But I, I could go from Plato theory, second Plato theory. Directly to the deflationary ontology, then, then uh, I could show this deflationary tendency in Plato. I could uh, uh, make this explicit in Hegel too. The reason is very, very, uh, is the same. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it might sound a bit alien. Uh, the question right now. Oh, yeah, the alien questions are the best. Yeah, I, I won't try to make it an alien. But my bad. Right, so I want to know you were talking about the uh, uh, system theory, right? Uh, and at some point in the answer to 2000, you, you actually said, well, it's, yeah, it's an order, uh, well, the somehow principle of coherency, right? Uh -huh. Then uh, my sole question, which is simple, is um, do you. I mean, have you somehow met the Edgar Morin's books mm -hmm. somehow mm -hmm. at some point? Mm -hmm. And will you then say you, you're kind of uh, ontologizing cybernetics? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have different views of system theory. This is the problem here. For example, uh, when we, have, when we uh, follow the ascending dialectics, uh, following the generalization of systems theory. Some views of system theory in the final remains incoherent. I, 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 I take an, uh, an example here, the, 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 the theory of Maturana in systems theory that goes to, to, for example, to sociology in the case of, uh, of uh, Lumen. Maturana was a cellular theorist, and all cell has a surrounding. And for Maturana, the identity of system is construct, uh, is really founded in the opposition between system and surrounding. Okay. Uh, it doesn't exist a system without a surrounding, because all systems, by definition, by Maturana's definition, needs to have a surrounding. If we apply this to sociology, uh, we have problems in Lumen theory. For example, this, this uh, 
blindness between right, a theory of right and uh, economy in the theory of sociology. Uh, but when we apply this theory for the universe, we have not a problem, a coolness, because the universe, per, uh, per definition, uh, doesn't have a, a surrounding. Then I, I prefer to work with, uh, with Kaufman's theory of complex adaptive systems, because the, the, the identity of the system is not a difference between system and surrounding, but the identity of the system is, the, is determined by the, by the direction of the movement of the system. If I know the attractor of the movement of self-organization of the system, we know the identity of the system. And then we can apply this to the theory of the whole, and the theory of the whole the collapse, does it collapse? This is, a, this is the point here. That I, 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 I'm not defending this or that theory of, of, of system theory. I, I, I'm making only a dialogue with system theory. And uh, for another reason, I think that uh, systems uh, theory need a, a deep formalization that we know we, we, we not, uh, we don't find we don't find in the system theory, but we find, for example, in network theory, or more more deeply in the the case of graph theory, and uh, and uh, the point here is only a dialogue, not. Uh, ground the ontology in these or that uh, theory of systems. But I prefer the system theory of Kaufman than the Maturino for other for this for, for, for this point for this reason. Last question. Thank you. To get back to my first question, does does systems theory presuppose that that the elements of a system are constituted such that they can interact. Mm -hmm. because my, my question was that for Mellenbrock, for example, he has to assume God exists to enable the elements of a system to interact. Like they interact because God makes them interact, as does Whitehead to a certain extent. Badu has the inconsistent multiplicity, and the way that these monads, so to speak, the inconsistent multiples interact is through the count of a subject. But then Latour says that, no, um, we don't need God, nor do we need the count of a subject. Um, All we need is a, is a um, that the, that, that, that inconsistent multiples that, uh, that make up a specific structure, a specific system, interact because of another inconsistent multiple. Um, but, and I think this is also a problem that Marcus gets into, mm -hmm. because he tries to, I think, with fields of sense, ontologize uh, language games. That fields of sense is like just an ontologized uh, Wittgenstein language game. Mm -hmm. But then Wittgenstein has family resemblance, mm -hmm. which enables um, two language games to interact, because mm -hmm they are at least sufficiently similar that there could be some kind of communication, mm -hmm. which is our argument against mm -hmm. private language. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have an ontological family resemblance, mm -hmm. then how do how is it possible for inconsistent multiples to interact at all? It seems like uh, without God or a subject, how is it possible for even for the elements to interact at all? Uh, he Hegel had, Hegel had a response for this uh Answer this question because not resolve it, <laughs> not resolve it. They, they had a point here because we need a, a principle of uh, an, an imminent principle of integration, not an external one. And what uh, Hegel uh, called uh, the logic of understanding uh, is right this, this kind of point of view that we produce determination. Or we produce invisible integration by external, uh, uh, by external criteria, mm. and uh, this is the point uh, for the presupposition of uh, Seth theory in the case of Badiou and in the case of uh, Marcus Grabel. Uh, uh, I, 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 I know that Marcus Grabel uh, uh, doesn't uh, want to. Uh, 
to have this binding between uh, his theory of ontology and uh, Seth theory, but I think that is there. And the problem with Seth theory that uh, we call element, elements are external presuppositions that uh, needs to bind by formal binding rules. Uh, but uh, we need to, to make uh, another movement. We need to have, uh, in, in formal theory, we need to have an uh, immanent principle of individuation in the case of ontology and in the case of logic. For example, in graph theory, we don't have this kind of presupposition. Uh, this is a really interesting paper uh, about uh, uh, constructing, construct, uh, constructing uh, uh, ontology as graph theory. And the point is this. And, uh, then I return for the first sentence, that uh, proposition that you from the beginning of the question, uh, the elements uh, uh, not only can uh, have relations to have determination, but uh, they they need to have relation. Uh, in dialectical theory, in dialectical ontology, the dialectical ontology is a relational ontology. There isn't determination without relation then we need to have a really relational theory in logic and in ontology. And set theory is the wrong theory. It's really the wrong theory for this, because we need a relational theory. Some people work with category theory, for example, but uh, others with category or, or with graph theory. And, but because we, we, we need the imminent principle of individuation. Without this, then we don't need the the idea of God or of the hypermonas in the case of Leibniz or the and so on and so on. This is the or the subject. We don't need this. I defend semantics uh, uh, expressivism. The principle of constitution of meaning is uh, is uh, integrated in the language and not in the relation between language and the world from the outside. And ontology is the same. As a, as a really a relational theory, but the relational theory is, uh, is a difficult theory to construct. It is. But we can construct, I think. We have the formal structures to, to build today. Is. Yeah. Thank you very much. Oh, okay.